What's up? Welcome back. I'm John Stark from MovieGuy.com, your favorite blind film critic. And this is a review of season one of Exploding Kittens, based on the card game. This is based on a card game. I didn't even know there was a card game called Exploding Kittens, but then again, I can't see the cards. So, <laughs> you know, uh, one of the first things that I did when I was blind is I found somebody who liked Magic the Gathering, and I was like, here, uh, I have a feeling this is going to be something I'm, it's either going to take me way too long to figure out how to play this, or what. So, you like magic? Go for it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, it was a nice gift for one of my friends. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, I, I don't, I don't know how canon this is to the card game. <laughs> um, but it does have audio description. It's International Digital Center. It's written by Liz Gutman uh, and narrated by Jamie Lemchek. Like the the, I'm gonna come up with like a name for them, like the devilish duo or something. I don't know. They're just when those two are paired together, the audio description tends to be really good. Also, Liz Gutman is just. It's kind of unfair to say she's the best writer in the game because she's the most credited writer in the game. So, because other companies are constantly only getting their narrator in, an International Digital Center has a deal where they constantly get their writer in, Liz has benefited a lot from that, and she is, like, soaring through the ranks of, <laughs> I mean, like, her credits, like, when you look at the things that she's written, you're, it's easy to just point and be like, wow, that's amazing. But also, it's easy to go, well, I really love this film, but this film only gave me a narrator. You know, like, who wrote that? Someone. But is it the same person who wrote this other film that I liked that also didn't have a listed writer? What about this film that didn't have a list? I mean, like, there are other things out there that don't have writers. So she's, like, defaulted into best writer, but she's defaulted there because we don't have any sort of standards in crediting an audio description. <laughs> Which is really disappointing. Sometimes your company may not get uh, credited at all. Or you may just get the company name. Or you get the company and the narrator. Well, IDC has a great relationship with Netflix. And because of that, we all know who Liz Gutman is in the blind community. Also, to my blind community, I want to say, got a purple hat on today. It's on backwards, a ba baseball cap, black sunglasses. I'm wearing a Thor t-shirt. So, uh, what is Exploding Kittens? It's a an adult animated uh, comedy um, that is about uh, some sort of reality in which heaven and hell both have like boards of directors that decide to turn God and the devil into cats and send them to earth because neither of them are good at their job. So they're supposed to pick up something from earth. Like, the god is supposed to, I don't know, get inspiration because he, uh, heaven thinks that, that humans have turned into, like, garbage things and, you know, we suck at life. And um, meanwhile, uh, hell thinks the devil's not being evil enough. And brilliant, brilliant voice casting here, by the way, because god is played by Tom Ellis who is also most well-known for playing Lucifer. So I caught that voice immediately. I was like, that's Tom Ellis playing God? So he's now played Lucifer and God. So his career is, he's clearly got like a type where people are like, we're doing something biblical. Can you come in here, please? <laughs> um... On the devil's side, it's Sashir Zamata uh, from Saturday Night Live. Previously, she was on... Uh, she was in the cast of Home Economics for the four... Was it four seasons? Did the thing run for three seasons? How long did it run for? Four seasons. I'm going to go with four. Uh, four seasons. And um, until it got canceled. And now she's voicing this. Voicing the devil cat. Um, I don't want to, like, spoil the whole thing. So, 
yeah, they're introduced. Actually, the devil cat isn't even introduced until the end of the first episode. The first episode is all about God cat. And then you learn the same things happen to the devil cat. And then that's intertwined. It's really weird how the linear storytelling is actually really strong in these episodes. You would think that this would be something that would be very episodic, um, where you could feel like, but no, actually there's a lot of a, there's a, a, a clear season thread in here, like a clear plot. Uh, this isn't just like wacky family with two wacky cats of each episode, you know? It has an actual plot to it that moves throughout the course of the season. So, um, and a direction that it's headed in, not just for the cats, but also for the family that they live in. They put them in this sort of like stereotypical family. There's, uh, you know, mom, dad, son, daughter, uh, other major characters in this is they have a neighbor named Karen, um, who I think is how the devil keeps getting back there because that name is very much alluding to something about this person's personality. <laughs> um, and then, uh, the son has a friend, Aiden, who is just... I can't remember what God said. He's like that. He, uh, he says something about like that kid. Uh, that's like if an onion ring learned how to talk or something like that. I don't know. It was really funny at the time, but it, it's just uh, uh, Aiden is Aiden. Aiden is just uh, great side characters, but um, you have to get to navigate through this. Uh, the mom has this weird fucking past, man. This The mom used to be part of, like, SEAL Team 3. And so she's, like, really good at, like, combat and strategy. But now she works for, like, she's, like, a vet. Something like that. <laughs> and, like, dad works as, like, a, a janitor for, like, a bulk store chain. Or a stockman or something. And then he has this plot that runs throughout the course of the season where his boss takes a stronger liking to him and he moves up in the company and god cat helps him do it and uh, uh yeah it's there are, it's weird how there are plots that like go all season long in an animated adult show like this which usually i think they think their audience can't follow it or they set it up in such a way that you can come in and out of it every episode but this would be really hard to watch out of con like if you were to randomize the episodes it wouldn't make any sense <laughs> It really is literally st linear storytelling, which I'm actually pleasantly surprised by. Um, of course, so is Sasha's Party, which I just reviewed. But that is more so because it feels like it's the sequel and they just broke it up into a series. Um, so this is its own thing. This is, I mean, it's exploding kittens runs for multiple seasons. Every season, I guess, is going to have a linear thread to it. Uh, okay, so a couple of things I want to talk about. One... One of the reasons I love Liz is because she has, she just knows like certain things happen. So there's a scene in one of the episodes where um, uh, the devil cat is having to do some stuff with marine life. I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, and there's an orca and it does the free willy jump and she acknowledges that it's the free willy jump. She... Uh, actually says it's the the jump from the movie Free Willy. Like, they set up the scene, so that way it's paying homage to something, and she acknowledges what the homage is. And I thought about that, because I was like, well, that's really cool. And then later on, there's another thing that happens, and I was thinking, she described what it is, and I don't know that anybody... Like, I know kind of what the target demographic is for adult animation, and especially something like Exploding Kittens coming out of a card game, I can imagine that this is probably a pretty young demographic that they're shooting for here, uh, that like adult swim demographic. So I used to play video games and uh, a lot. Uh, I don't mean to offend you, but um, so there's a scene where Travis, the son in the family, he's playing an online video game and he's betrayed by Aiden and his other friends who don't matter because they never really appear ever again. But 
um, in this thing when he's kind of like having a fight with Aiden and he gets killed. And there's a reference to um, one of the characters is then over Travis's dead body and he's sort of like uh, squat, squat standing, squat standing, squat standing, or kneel, kneel standing, kneel standing. There's a term for that. And I'm wondering, did we choose not to use the term? Because there's a lot easier way to say what that is. Or did we not, like, and I thought about, I've, I've been, <laughs> I've given this way more thought. Like, it's called teabagging. Uh, and gamers would know that if you, <laughs> if you put that in there, anybody who played games, and this is from a card game, would know what that is. Uh, your, your child, does your child play Fortnite? They know what, they know what teabagging is. I'm sorry. Your children know <laughs> what teabagging is. <laughs> they may not fully understand the reference, but they know how to do it in a video game. Ask them to do it, and I guarantee you they will squat and stand and squat and stand over the per over the body slash preferably the head of the person they've just killed. Um, it is quite common in first person shooters, so uh, <sighs> so it is kind of a vulgar. It has like a vulgar back to it, but it is. I mean. I didn't come up with it. It's it, and I, I play, like I said, I played video games for years online, and regardless of what game I was playing, um, if it was any sort of a first-person shooter at all, or even sort of like a Grand Theft Auto type of thing, I mean, people would do it, you know. And um, sometimes you see people doing it like as a suggestion, like pre you know, like they're like a like a threatening gesture. You'd see somebody stand and squat and stand and squat. <laughs> Just to like let you know that what they're about to do to you. Uh it's very common in gamer culture. And I'm wondering if it has proliferated enough that they that she could have just said what it was. Because it is a video game that he's playing and it is a gamer word. And honestly, I think the target demographic for this would have understood that term. However, is that an acceptable term to use in audio description? Probably not. Although her audio description on Bridgerton is getting attention for being, you know, uh, really well done and uh, very just sort of this is what's happening and very well written. So I don't know, but it did make me think. It really made me think a lot more than I needed to about anything else that happened in this series. I was like, could we have just said teabagging? Um, <laughs> I have more thoughts on that than I do anything else. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like her, the rest of the stuff is really great. Uh, there are, um, you know, I think about something like this, some random ass fucking show on Netflix and they have all of these cameos. There's a, again, I'm trying not to spoil things. So there's a scene where um, a bunch of different people are battling for something, but it's also some like iconic uh, trademarked figures that are battling. So you have like Ronald McDonald, uh, you have the, the uh, Michelin Man <laughs> is in there. Um, so, and those are brand trademarks. I think the Pillsbury Doughboy was in there because there was a reference to killing the Doughboy. Um, and I think that, I think he was in there too. Uh, just sort of a lot of those types of trademarked icons. But they were referenced by name. Instead of describing them to us like Disney felt the need to do in Chippendale's Rescue Rangers or ignore them altogether, you know, um the whole purpose of that scene was to show us all those people. So we got told who they were, which is fucking brilliant. I was thinking even about like Scream, the last Scream movie where they had uh, the scene on the, on the subway and all those people were wearing different Halloween masks. And some of those Halloween masks were references to like clear, like, Michael Myers, Jason type references, like side of the people were like, I know what mask that is. Um, 
but uh, we didn't get that in the audio description. So here we got these direct references to these characters in the audio description, and we're told what they were doing. So that's what I liked about it. I mean, I like the specificity. I like the fact that this does something that uh, other people are afraid to do and don't do and stay away from and think that we don't need as blind people. Uh, I like that I got brought in on that, you know, that, that it, we were given the opportunity to join in on that fun and that conversation. Um, I think this series is promising, especially the way that it ends. Uh, even if you are questionable on season one, I'll say season two and season one ends in a way that season two should be totally different than season one. So if, if see, season one has such a weird ending that says, please give us a, a second season, please give us more episodes. We have to have more episodes because we need to be able to, to show you what this would be like. Um, it's sort of like the last time, if this was canceled after one season, it would feel like the last time Netflix did that where I was, where a show was screaming for a second season, like where you feel like the whole first season is a setup for the actual premise to the show, um, which is what this does. It feels like season one is like a prologue uh, and then season two is going to be, okay, this is Exploding Kittens. Uh, they did Hillary Swank's Away. They did, like, they made us watch the entire first season of Hillary Swank floating towards Mars. And it was slow as shit. And then they land on Mars and they cancel the show. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> we had to watch, we had to watch, we had to sit through her getting to Mars. The most interesting thing would have been her on Mars. <laughs> and now you're like, nah. Nah. Nope. And I was just, I was so angry at Netflix. I didn't even really like the show that much because the, the, the season one had problems because it was stretching out the time. It was like, oh my God, we're going to take forever to get to Mars. <laughs> I was like, I don't need this. Um, but then we got there and I was like, okay, good, great. Next season is going to be great. They won't cancel a Hillary Swank drama. They canceled the Hillary Swank drama. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't what they didn't understand was season two actually had the potential to bring people in because people would have finally been like oh my god thank you uh, just skip season one you know <laughs> watch the pilot so you know who the characters are jump the next couple of episodes and then just start to watching season two when they're on mars um so yeah if season one if i don't know if, there's not, if you're not jiving with it season two stands to be something that you might actually like uh, because it's, I, I can't imagine that it's going to be the exact same thing that we just watched. So, um, just how they end it. So, yeah, um, I'm interested, I'm intrigued, uh, all that good stuff. And the audio description was really good. It made me think really heavily about Ken teabagging me a part of audio description. <laughs> which I've never thought about before, which is sort of like a credit to the TV show itself. And, uh. Also Liz's description, and she did actually describe what teabagging was because I knew what it was from her description. I was like, okay, so the teabagging, you know what I'm saying? But like, do we use the slang term for it? <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. Like, um, it's an interesting thought. Uh, I, I don't think I'm right, though. I think what Liz did is the right way to do it because more people have accessibility to it but if I'm just I don't know that uh, yeah I think more people would have laughed if she had said teabagging from that community so I don't know it's it's like it's, it's like a coin toss for me like I could go either way on that um there's an argument for both anyway uh I like I like the show uh it's promising to me it, adult animation is like all over the place all the time now but um my God, uh, Marvel's Hit Monkey is returning. That's going to be the next thing that I do a full series review of this season two of that. I didn't even know we were getting a season two of Hit Monkey. So, uh, adult animation is, is, and Kite Man comes out and just, uh, my God. So, thanks for watching. I'm going to give Exploding Kitten season one an A minus. For the most part, I really like this season. Uh, I, I think it, it's, it's a, it's a much stronger start 
for an adult animation than I've had from a lot of adult animations that have been thrown at me from all over the place. I really loved the linear storytelling, which adult animations don't lean so heavily on. But there were a lot of stories that really benefited from you having to watch this from start to finish instead of just, like, jumbling up the episodes. And, oh, this will be great for syndication, you know? Like, whatever. Anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. And I'll see you guys on the other side.